in this video, it's on like Donkey Kong. Or is it? This is Coinop, the arcade guide from Gray Fox Books. Hey everyone, John here. Today we're looking at a book about arcade games. I mean like real arcade games. Remember those? Video games presented in coin or token operated game cabinets, typically featured with others of its kind in public spaces called arcades. You know, before they were replaced with simpler and quicker games of chance that dispensed tokens or points meant to redeem for prizes that likely would have been easier and cheaper to just buy. Though the golden era of arcade games is behind us. Arcade games aren't totally gone, as there are bars and restaurants specifically dedicated to these old school public gaming experiences, and they are a popular focus for emulation, including for do-it-yourselfers who build their own custom cabinets. Since 2018, there are widely available and reasonably affordable kits from Arcade 1UP that allow you to build slightly smaller cabinets featuring a handful of classic games, which can also be fun to customize and modify, especially to install many more classic games and bring those arcade experiences home. Another way of reliving some arcade games, though in a more analog way, is via this book, Coinop, the Arcade Guide, written by Darren Doyle and published by Gray Fox Books. For the most part, this book features images and reviews of 176 arcade games. There was also a trivia section, bunched into 22 segments about many more games and companies, and a Hall of Fame gallery with flyer or marquee artwork for 90 games, some of which are from the games reviewed, but many other games only appear here. There are a couple write-ups, including the history of Data East, and also Darren Doyle's reminiscence of his personal arcade experiences. Then three interviews with arcade proprietors, and one with Griffin Aerotech, makers of new arcade games Sky Cursor and Enter the Gungeon, House of the Gun Dead. Let's dive into this catalogue of delightfully pixelated 80s and 90s adventures. First, let's take a look at the games. Now, there are literally thousands of arcade games, so of course a book like this would only be able to showcase a tiny fraction. Thankfully, the game selection is mostly pretty good. Bubble Bobble, Double Dragon, Dragon's Lair, Galaga, Gauntlet, Ghosts and Goblins, House of the Dead, Mortal Kombat, Outrun, The Simpsons, Spy Hunter, Street Fighter 2, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Tekken, Zaxxon. There are definitely a bunch here that many people would recognize as landmark or iconic games in the history of coin-operated games. I expected, and I'm glad, to see these and others. Naturally, there are many other games, some lesser known, obviously those in the chapter dedicated to obscure games, but each genre-specific chapter also has a designated hidden gem, which I'll get into a bit more later. It is nice to learn more about games that might not be that well known, and I don't think I have too much of a problem with anything that was included. Well, there is that section on Data East featuring 32 Data East games. I don't have an issue with it, other than I would have liked it if other companies were given a spotlight feature too. Maybe something to consider if there are ever more volumes of Coin Off the Arcade Guide? Of course, what is more concerning than what is included is what is excluded. An obvious pick is the pop culture character so synonymous with arcades that he's practically their mascot, Pac-Man. The original game is the most expected choice, but being obvious shouldn't disqualify it from being featured in a review here. There is a bit about Pac-Man in the trivia section, but I think it certainly could have had a one-page review at least. Yes, it's a single-screen game, but that doesn't stop Galaga from having a full review, a two-pager even. At least Pac-Man as a character gets an appearance in the review for Pac-Land. No Q-Bird or Frogger though. There's also a big omission of a whole company, and you know I would mention it, as it is Nintendo. Donkey Kong does get an appearance in the Hall of Fame gallery, but no review. Kind of feels like there should be a place in this book for the Mario Brothers before they became Super, or the Punch-Out arcade games, or Killer Instinct as the first game to have a hard disk but Donkey Kong especially has a major place in arcade history. Originally developed to swap into unsold Raider Scope cabinets when Nintendo saw that it wasn't selling, it changes the fortune of what is still one of the biggest video game companies today, so it's weird to barely acknowledge it, only getting a few lines in the trivia section. I have heard that sometimes Nintendo can be challenging to work with when making books like this, so, though quite speculative, that might explain Donkey Kong's lack of a review, and Nintendo content in general. But on that note, there are question mark blocks from Super Mario Bros. to decorate the top of the Digi Know trivia section and its place in the table of contents. But the Super Mario Bros. series isn't really something I would associate with the arcade. Yes, there is Versus Super Mario Bros., an arcade version which has some differences from the NES Super Mario Bros., but the arcade Versus version is nowhere as well known or groundbreaking as its home console version. Super Mario Bros. is therefore very synonymous with the original Nintendo Entertainment System, 
and Mario and Luigi themselves are representative of Nintendo as a whole, but especially after their arcade era, so these blocks really look quite out of place. As I said, the Mario Brothers before they became Super would have been more than fair game, as that is indeed a classic arcade game, but those question mark blocks are not from that. Anyway, 100 arcade games are reviewed in the main chapters, which are genre specific. 13 of them are beat em ups, like Double Dragon and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. 14 of them are categorized as arcade racers, or Driveng, Drivnig, Drivniga, Driving, according to the back of the book, including Outrun and Super Off Road. 13 of them are shoot em ups, such as Galaga and Zaxxon. 13 of them are in the arcade action chapter, or referred to as action adventure on the back, including Ghosts and Goblins and Shinobi. The miscellaneous arcade classics feature 14 games, with Bubble Bobble, Gauntlet, and the like. There are 11 obscure games, like Timber and a Steinax, and among the 11 horror games are Splatterhouse and House of the Dead. 11 is also a fitting number for the 1v1 fighting games, which of course include Street Fighter 2 and Mortal Kombat. Of the main 100 reviews, the games range from 1980's Rally X to 2000's Guilty Year X, with those being the only games from those years. There are games from every year in between, except there are none from 1999. The most popular year, or the mode, is 1987, with 15 games, with at least one game in every chapter, except for the horror chapter. 1987 also happens to be the median. The average year mathematically, or the mean, is 1988. 67 of the 100 games, pretty much two-thirds, are from the 1980s, with 32 from the 1990s, mostly from the first half of the decade, and then Guilty Gear X is the only one from the year 2000. Of these main reviews, 90 have two-page spreads, and 10 take up single pages. There is also an honorable mention section at the end, featuring another 8 single-page reviews, and 4 half-page reviews, and 32 tiny reviews, and earlier in the book with a history recap of Data East, are another 32 reviews the second half of which has their first letter spelling out DATA EAST ROCKS ah, and the first half spelling OIS BO JOM KIS DAM an anagram of a midway boss jam, okay? So that's 176 arcade game reviews in all. Scanning the table of contents, it initially seems like the only case of a game and its sequel is the original Street Fighter and of course Street Fighter 2. If you're familiar with fighting games, you would also know that Fatal Fury 2 and The King of Fighters 94 are connected. If you include the hidden gems, then you get Star Wars, a prequel to Return of the Jedi, even though one might nitpick and say they are based on movies within the same series, as opposed to the Return of the Jedi game being a sequel to the Star Wars game, if that makes sense. If you count the honorable mentions chapter, then you get Bionic Commando, Golden Axe The Revenge of Death Adder, Outrunners, and Wonder Boy, all of which are either sequels or prequels to other reviewed games. And then there's Robocop, a hidden gem, with its sequel, Robocop 2, in the Data East section. What I'm getting at is, at least for the full-size reviews, it looks like Doyle was mostly avoiding games within the same series to allow for more variety. The games are divided into eight chapters based on their genres, though the fifth chapter is for the miscellaneous arcade classics, and the sixth chapter is for obscure games, where their classic status, or their uncommonality, finds them more than their gameplay style. The latter does feel a little redundant though, as each chapter also has one hidden gem, that is, a game not as well known as the other ones featured in that genre. These include the beat em up Vendetta, the racer WEC Le Mans, the shoot em up Star Wars, the action adventure Robocop, the miscellaneous classic Paperboy, the obscure Charlie Ninja, the horror game Dragon Gun, and the fighting game Guilty Gear X. Doyle seems to want them to remain hidden as they are not listed in the table of contents and all their page numbers are simply XDX, with the page numbers continuing on around them, but no one other than this book counts like 34, 35, XDX, XDX, 36, 37. What page is Dragon Gun on? Oh, XDX. What page is Paperboy on? XDX. No, not that XDX, the other XDX. That is absolutely not how pages are supposed to work. Then the Honorable Mentions chapter doesn't get an introduction, though it feels like the one that is in the most need of one. Though mentioned in the table of contents, it is just at the tail end of the 1v1 fighting game chapter instead of set aside as distinct, like the Arcader's Perspective or the Flyer and Marquee Hall of Fame are, and it just lists the section as a whole, as opposed to listing each game like in the main reviews. I 
if they're really honorable mentions, shouldn't they be, you know, mentioned? At least the full page ones should be, since there are reviews from the main chapters that are also on just one page and do get a mention on the table of contents. Obscure stuff aside, the genres should otherwise make for a neat division. Or they would, though some multi-genre games are harder to classify. The fourth chapter is called Arcade Action, but all the games are full of action, so I prefer the term Action Adventure as described in that chapter's introduction and as mentioned on the back. Now, Contra is listed here. Is it really that different from Shock Troopers despite the different perspective? Shock Trooper genre, according to its info box, says Vertical Shooter, which is not accurate since the action goes diagonally and horizontally as well. Anyway, it is in the Shoot'em Up chapter, which is otherwise full of games with spaceships and planes, or Gunbird and Parodius, which include characters capable of flying. Point is, Shock Troopers stands out since the characters don't fly, though they do shoot, which is the point. But there's also a lot of shooting in Contra, so I feel like either Contra should join it there, or that Shock Troopers should join Contra in the action adventure category. The horror games could also belong in the other categories, since the genre classification here is based on content as opposed to gameplay style, which would make a couple of them beat em ups and most of them light gun shooters, though that isn't a chapter here. But you'd think it should be, since games with tethered pistols or huge mounted guns really are part of the arcade experience. So I guess it's also weird that Time Crisis isn't here, or any games with physical guns that are not horror games. But whatever chapter Contra and Shock Troopers are in, at least they made the cut. And aside from the hidden gems and honorable mentions, you can at least find them in the table of contents. Seems odd to me though, that the games in most chapters are almost in alphabetical order there. But then there's usually some little misplacement that jumbles it up. It makes sense that the single page reviews in the first five chapters would be paired up for layout purposes, allowing the two pages to get a proper spread. But most of these single pages aren't alphabetical between the two of them, and aside from those, there are still others out of place. It looks like there was an attempt to alphabetize them, so why not follow through? And they're most definitely not in chronological order either, which would have been a good way to order them too. Now, let's look at the reviews. There's not a lot written about each game, usually two to four paragraphs for the main reviews. The text often doesn't take up much space, so the rest of the area is full of images. Typically, there are numerous random screenshots. Sometimes there are much smaller sequential screenshots showcasing the game's ending. Outside of screenshots, there are many sprites, usually of playable characters and often fancy close-ups of them in cutscenes to really show off the art. The 80s and 90s had great pixel art, especially in arcade games, but credit also goes to this book's designers for the pleasing layout and good selection of imagery. When reviewing other game books, I often complain when there are a low number of screenshots, as one or two usually can't really represent a whole game. But this book makes good use of the opportunity to showcase more of each game. Besides images from within the game themselves, there are often scans of flyers advertising the machine to owners of gaming establishments, as well as some official artwork, like the kind that would adorn the original arcade cabinet. Arcade games are often very colorful, as they are meant to be eye-catching, and therefore it's no surprise that much of this book is quite the visual feast. I'm sure I'll say it again, but the imagery is very much coin up the arcade guide's strength, and the whole selling point of this book. If you buy this, it will be because of how it looks. Now, as for how it reads, the reviews or summaries are what you'd expect, talking about each game's place in gaming history, the premise of the game's story, and some gameplay features. Often, things of interest such as game titles and character names are bolded and colored, which is a nice touch. The summary for Street Fighter 2 was written by a guest writer, Duncan Woodward, and so this recap has a different tone than the other ones. Half of this review is his personal experience of encountering this game for the first time. Though he does a good job of finishing off by explaining its monumental place in gaming history, it is weird to not mention, even briefly, the many upgrades that the series is known for. You know, like the Champion Edition, Turbo Super, Super Turbo, that sort of thing. Which has made incremental versions now a commonplace thing in the fighting genre especially. And unlike most other reviews in this book, it doesn't get into mentioning any of the characters by name. Which is odd considering how iconic Street Fighter 2 characters are, not only in gaming, but pop culture. The tiny descriptions in the Data East and Honorable Mention sections fit 8 to a page, and are typically two short paragraphs and a single screenshot in the in-game title. Not much is said, these summaries are usually concise. A single screenshot doesn't compare to the two pages of visuals that most of the main reviews get, but hey, they're here at least. The reviews do have a habit of concluding by saying, you must play this game, or some version of this, 
which gets a little redundant, as all these games were carefully selected to begin with, so wouldn't it be assumed that these are all recommendably good games? For the most part, I don't usually have a problem with the intent and meaning of the text, as in what it is saying. But there are a number of issues with how it is saying it. First, the layout. I can understand having the text split into two columns to ease the readability, but I don't think it helps to have three columns, especially on pages where the text doesn't reach across the whole page. And there are even a few pages with four columns. This is unnecessary and makes it somewhat awkward to read. A few reviews do come in single columns, and more of them really should have been this way. Then, we have the spelling, grammar, and punctuation, which are all really something else. I sincerely hope these errors are corrected, if there are later revisions. I don't know if there will be, but if so, I do hope they take the opportunity to fix these, as this first printing is just a nightmare for English teachers. Or anyone that reads English at all. Now, I feel I actually do need to ease up on nitpicking on such things in my book reviews in general, but there are just so many errors in this book, it is to a level that cannot be ignored. I alluded to the drivneg on the back of the book. That's a bad first impression, to misspell an entire category's name in big letters right on the back cover. And it's not the only error on the back. Many of the other spelling errors within are like where when it should be were, as in words are misspelled to become their homonyms or near homonyms, which might have eluded spell checkers if they were used. Like patience, when he means patience subseded when he means succeeded, or odd phrases like go by the waist side instead of wayside. I'm not going to list all of the misspellings, as there are many. Isn't it also odd that the word crap is censored twice, but hell isn't? Or is it just me? I've never thought of crap as a swear word. It's not a nice term, but not strong enough to require censoring. Every now and then there are oddly constructed sentences, like Simon's weapon of choice, that of his strengthened chained wipe, warning star. What? I know he means whip, and not wipe, but it's still strange. Or even worse, whatever this whole first paragraph of Chiller is saying. There are also many instances of doubled sentence ending punctuation, or random words starting with a capital letter. And there is inconsistency. It's one thing to get something incorrect, but then you'd think one would at least be consistent in that error. Not here. For the game Alien vs Predator, within a short review, it is written differently a number of times. First, as aliens, plural, vs Predator, then aliens, with an apostrophe, which is definitely incorrect, vs Predator, then the correct alien vs Predator, and finally back to the plural, aliens vs Predator. Even worse, there is a butchering of the names of two of the three arcade establishments in their interviews and these are simple names. Firstly, there's an interview with Alan O'Grady of Level Up. Now, on the official signage, you can see it's in all capital letters and one word. Maybe it's considered stylized that way, so I could see a case being made for it to be written, maybe something like Level Up, within the text of the interview. But guess what? Something as simple as Level Up is written in many different ways. Not just two, not three, or even four. We've got six different ways of capitalizing and or spacing Level Up. Come on now. Then, another one is called Free Play, owned by Jay Leone. Just like Level Up, Free Play is not difficult to spell, but somehow the various ways of capitalizing and spacing give it some variety. In this case, there are four different variants. Just... How is this even possible? We're talking about the names of the bars, and therefore the whole subject of these pieces. They're not difficult names, and finding four to six different ways to write them out is so bizarre that this almost feels like it would almost have to be deliberate. But if so, for what purpose, I have no idea. Or else so incredibly flippant, uncaring how to capitalize and space them, or even paying attention to how they were written before. Still statistically weird to come up with new ways to write it. Then there's even a chunk of the Level Up interview that is repeated pretty much verbatim. Now, I know I sound harsh. When I do understand it, and when I'm not distracted by how it's done, I do actually like most of what the text is actually saying. But it really needed to be proofread, as it does take away from the professionalism that the polished imagery and overall design would otherwise suggest. Maybe thankfully for this book, I'm not as knowledgeable in arcade games compared to console games to be able to totally shred this in a fact check. But there are some things that I noticed. 
Sure, there are minor counting errors, like the Shock Troopers review saying there are 7 characters, when there are clearly 8. Or Samurai Showdown saying there are 12 characters, but then immediately listing only 11. But here's a big mistake. And for a popular game too, which is why I noticed it and have to call it out. The Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles article mentions a Super Nintendo version of the game. There is no version of the original arcade game for that. The original was ported to the NES. The sequel, Turtles in Time, is the one that is ported to the Super NES. The review goes on to mention that sequel right after the sentence about the Turtles being on the Super NES, so they were clearly referring to the original arcade game. It's the Turtles, man! Everyone knows the Turtles, so of course it's worse to have an error here than if there was something incorrect about Charlie Ninja. Sorry, Charlie Ninja. And the other one I noticed is Virtua Fighter 2 reportedly having 300,000 polygons per fighter. Better check who reported that. Just looking at the fighters, it's obvious there aren't 300,000 polygons, come on. You can see the blockiness, like they might have maybe a few dozen per limb. While I couldn't seem to find an exact count of polygons, it seems that Virtua Fighter 2 actually has fewer polygons than the original Virtua Fighter, but the sequel still looks better due to improved textures. And according to Edge Magazine, the arcade version of the original game has between 1500 and 2500 polygons per fighter. So Virtua Fighter 2 should have fewer polygons if it's true about the textures. But even if the polygon count was about the same, it would still be nowhere near 300,000. 2500 isn't even 1% 1 of 300,000. How do you get something wrong by a factor of over 100? Since the reviews are short, it should be even more important to be fully correct. Lastly, a few other things. There are some gatefold pages. The first one is the Outrun review, which opens up to nice Outrun artwork. Though the bottom quarter is almost entirely black. And another gatefold, which is in the Action Adventure chapter, shows a screenshot of the Ninja Warriors. It's just a plain screenshot from the start of the game, and other than drawing attention to the ultra widescreen aspect ratio, is not particularly interesting. So I thought these were underwhelming. In contrast, the Did You Know Trivia section is packed almost overwhelmingly with trivia. There are several monetary statistics which personally didn't interest me, and it didn't help that many of the stats are several years old. But there's a variety of other things here, including some stuff that may be common knowledge to arcade goers like the infamous Shenlong situation in Street Fighter 2, but also some more obscure yet neat nuggets of info here. However, the trivia is packed in with such small text. It probably could have been spread out over 6 or 8 pages to be a bit more comfortably arranged than on just 4 pages. Plus, if the trivia was spread out on more pages, then there could be images to accompany the trivia, which would certainly be helpful, instead of just titles and a few character sprites. Also, the repeated use of the arcade trivia header within the same page is odd. I'm guessing here, but it looks like these bits of trivia may have been intended to be spread throughout the book. Hence why they're in multiple boxes and the header shows up multiple times but then later decided to be put all together into a dedicated section. And, you know, there was all that stuff I said earlier about the Super Mario Bros. question mark blocks here that may be iconic of video games in general, but not arcade games. To end on a positive, we do have this cool artwork by UK artist and game designer, Simon Phipps. It features arcade game characters playing their own games. It is featured on some Kickstarter backer rewards, including a poster and a cushion. But since you can't get these anymore, you can still see it here in this book, between pages 75 and 76. You know, because of some pages not having page numbers. Yeah. That's not how pages work. Anyway, that's pretty much coin off the arcade guide. So, to recap. While there is a lack of any amount of proofreading, I can't deny the care put into the visuals. Lots of screenshots and other images nicely arranged, with lots of color and variety, put this book visually on the highest tier of the books I've reviewed on this channel. It just looks great. Side note, I wish there were Nintendo specific books in this style, like for the NES or Super NES, though I imagine that could be challenging to get the right to do so. Yet, somehow Darren Doyle and Grey Fox Books pulled it off for this one. The gallery of marquee and flyer artwork is nice, as it is simple and clean. The brick wall background that makes each flyer look like a poster is a nice touch. The game selection looks good to me for the most part. But to be comprehensive, I was hoping there would be reviews of a few fundamentals, like Pac-Man and Donkey Kong, perhaps some non-horror Lycan games like Time Crisis, and mentioning the Street Fighter 2 characters by name. I also don't agree with keeping the hidden gems hidden by not mentioning them in the table of contents, or even giving them proper page numbers. The Data East section is fine, but I would have liked to see other companies have a spotlight feature too. Despite being a 300-page book, 
it's a quick read, though you will spend more time taking in the images than reading the text anyway. Do I recommend this book, Coin Off the Arcade Guide? If you like and remember arcade games as they should be, or want to see and learn more of arcade experiences, then absolutely yes! There aren't many books that I've seen of coin off games, surprisingly. So if it is indeed an uncommon topic, then you should get in on this. The imagery is the real selling point, which is why I jumped into supporting this at my first glance without any hesitation. See, it says right here on the Kickstarter backers page. Where are we here? Wait, my name's not where it should be for alphabetical order. And I'm not the only one, which makes it worse. And unless the guy above me is actually named Jeffrey Yuri Jonathan, it looks like my first name is doubled up. Really? Out of all the people here, you're going to double up the name of the one guy that would publicly point this out? Well, apologies if the guy's name really is Jeffrey Yuri Jonathan. And I guess either way, my name is still intact and correct on one line. But speaking of bad text, yes, it's enough that it hurts the score. Unless this has been or will be fixed for later printings, if there are any, I'm going to have to give this book a 3.5 out of 5. If the text were free of basic spelling and punctuation errors, this would have been a 4.5, easily. If you'd like to get your eyeballs on Darren Doyle's Coin Off the Arcade Guide, you can purchase it through greyfoxbooks.com through the link on screen here, or in this video's description. So, do you have memories of arcades as they were? Are the current barcade experiences comparable? What are your favorite games? Feel free to comment below and we can discuss. Also, if you like this content, please remember to hit that like button and the subscribe button if you want to see more. And share this with your whole gang. Maybe the crowd you used to hang out with at the arcade? Every like, share, and subscribe is extremely helpful to me, and I absolutely appreciate every one of these actions, since these videos take a lot of time to make, and at the moment, I get nothing else out of it other than the enjoyment of sharing something and hoping you will find value in these two. So if you enjoyed this, let me know. Thanks so much for watching. See ya!